My name is Carrie Ann, and I have just a few quick comments to make before we get started. We do have our Ask Echo Meter webpage where we will post a link to access a recording of today's session on our YouTube channel. So you can go out to the website right now and download session eight. Um, there's a couple of things you can download for today. One is the, the PDF documentation bundle that contains a PDF of today's presentation, as well as two technical papers that one will reference during the session. And you can also download the TAM examples file that will be used during the session today. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to Ask Echo Meter. My name is Carrie Ann Taylor, and along with myself from Echo Meter, we have Gustavo Fernandez, who will be running the chat and assisting with the Q&A session. Also, Ken Skinner, Dr. Tony Podio, Dieter Becker, and we have Lynn Rowland, who will be leading the discussion today. Today's session is titled, Troubleshoot and Analyze Sucker Rod Wells Using Reference Load Lines and Pressure Annotations. So, Lynn, I will turn it over to you now. All right. Thank you, Carrie Ann. Uh, this is a uh, presentation that is... Um, somewhat based on surface measure data and a lot of the reference lines uh, a concept was presented by back in the 60s by a, a couple of engineers from Conoco uh, Gibson and Swain so there's a I didn't reference that paper there's also another paper by I think Lawrence Merriman and that's a 1950s paper and uh, both of those are available from the Southwest Petroleum Short Course uh, on a CD, or you can download those specific papers. So, so those references are in the uh, presentation. I don't have, have Gibson's and Swain, Swain's reference, but they also have presentations and papers on the Short Course CD. So you might consider uh, ordering that from, uh, we'll, you can email us and we'll send you uh, the the address for for Rhonda Brewer so that you can purchase a CD with uh, uh, over 55 years of technical papers on uh, artificial lift and a lot on rod, rod pumping. The um, the software we'll use today is is a TAM software, and you can go to our uh, software webpage and download it if you don't have it on your computer. Uh, that can be uh, we'll, at the end of the class after the Q of A, we've put together eight different examples that show these uh, load lines that we'll discuss during the presentation. Um, the two papers that we included in the download, uh, one of them is called uh, Reference Load Lines, and uh, it's, it's not only the reference load lines for the surface dynamometer measure data, it's also for the calculated downhole pump car, which we'll talk about a little bit. And at the end of the class, we'll go through and, and review these, uh, uh, how, you, how we can use these load lines to analyze and troubleshoot wells. The, uh, the, this 1998 paper was a paper that I wrote um, prior to come work for Echometer when we were uh, working with um, uh, Sandia when they did the downhole load cell. And we were having... Uh, a discussion about how the load should be displayed and how they should be calculated. So we'll we'll cover cover some of that also during this this presentation. Um, I'd like to thank Carrie Ann for the introduction, and Gustavo is going to handle the questions and get that all prepared for the Q and A session toward the toward the. Uh, this will take about an hour. Uh, what do you need to know when you're going to go to a well to troubleshoot it well? Uh, when we're talking about loads, the the representative production data, oil and water, uh, and the the gas is going to have an impact on the the weight of rods and fluid. And if you don't put the production data into the software, then we're going to assume that it's uh, uh, salty water, and it's going to calculate a different load, slightly different than what it would be. So the, the production data is also important in terms of pump capacity. And last week we talked about the effective uh, pump fillage line. So 
we'd like to compare the calculated pump displacement to the actual production, and that's a, a troubleshooting technique. And uh, they'll usually be pretty daggum close if you use the uh, correction for free gas in the pump and slippage, which we talked about last week. Uh, you need to know the relationship between the producing pressure at the bottom of the well and the reservoir pressure to determine if you're efficiently producing the well uh, nearest maximum rate. Uh, you want to know the equipment that is in the well, the rod string, the plunger size, the, the clearances, the tubing size. Um, when, when we say energy efficiency, mechanical losses are a big issue. When you have uh, low efficiencies, which a lot of energy is being wasted due to mechanical, mechanical friction, then the efficiency of the system will be low. So uh, we can measure the input power and compare that to the polished rod horsepower and then look at the, that compared to the horse, pump horsepower and see overall system efficiency and see surface efficiency and that can help us analyze the well. The wellbore description is important because we need the deviation survey, we need to know if there's liners, uh, we need to know the size of the tubing and casing for uh, gas flow rates, uh, packers and things like that and need to be defined. Uh, the design. Well, when you when you we've got a program called QRod. We'll probably talk about QRod sometime during a, a presentation. But it's a, a fairly simple design program, and you want to probably at, at a minimum run the QRod program and compare the calculated uh, design calculations to the actual measured data and see if there's any issues there. The fluid properties, the oil gravity, water gravity are used to calculate the weight of rods in fluid if there's no gas and then you have to add the the lightning effect of the gas to get a, a accurate gradient in the tubing. Um, we'll talk about and also probably you need the past history. So you need to know what's been problems in the well or problems in your field. You need to know your, how your production's uh, declining and what your percent oil is. So all those things are important to troubleshoot a well. Now this is a screen uh, in TWM and I show this because uh, this is the dynamic card screen and down here at the bottom is a button called the dynamic card options and that's where you access um, when the advanced modes turned on in TWM that's where you access the um, reference load lines that we're going to talk about during this presentation and so when you click that button this screen pops up and there's a, a, a subset of the, of the annotations that are available in TAM and you check the ones that you want to display and these dashed lines will appear on your uh, surface card and pump card and be a reference for um, to help you understand your well better. Now this is the TWM, the TAM software now on the screen and this is an example of uh, data that a file we're going to use and it's on a download file that you download and I've, I've got some var variables highlighted here in blue. Here's a, the pump intake pressure and over here is uh, some annotations and pressures, discharge pressure, and that's the pressure inside the pump chamber, and that's the pump intake pressure based on the flow level. And then over here on this right-hand side is the uh, annotation button that will bring up these uh, reference load lines. When I click on that button, this screen pops up. And the, there's quite a few uh, reference load lines. And TAM has the option that allows you to select the fluid level that goes along with the dynamometer data so that you can use the pump intake pressure and some of these calculations. We'll discuss the calculations and how uh, pump intake pressure impacts them. So the one I usually check first is uh, display the surface and pump card on one plot. Um, and then I typically show the calculated weight of rods in fluid plus the, the fluid load from the fluid level shot. And this, to me, would be a theoretical calculation. And outside of the dynamometer data, the fluid levels measured external, it's also a check. And then I'll show the weight of rods calculated in fluid based on what you have input in the software. And then we, ta we have, I usually show the maximum load line uh, based on zero pump intake pressure for the pump card. And I typically show the flow load line from uh, the fluid level shot and, and that should match closely to the height of the pump card and we've talked about that in previous previous ask echometer presentations and then I usually probably almost always show the valve open close points because for the calculations 
to work properly inside TAM, those, those valve open close points need to be moved to the corner of the pump card. And if they're not there, then the calculations may be off. Uh, the zero load line is where the pump card should rest. And that means on the downstroke, there's uh, no load being applied to the rods by the pump. And we'll talk about that reference load line. And then the effective plunger travel line. And some, I'll probably also check this maximum plunger travel line for the pump card and the equivalent gas free pump fillage line. So those lines, those reference lines, I often, I often check. And then over here, these, these, these three check boxes here, I turn off and on when I'm trying to look at uh, tubing movement, rod stretch, slippage. I'll use these, these three check boxes for uh, rod stretch on the rods and tubing tubing stretch and then an anchor tubing stretch line. So I'll I'll turn those on and off and maybe turn this one on and off trying to compare the measured trailing valve load to the theater, theoretical trailing valve load here and then the measured standing valve load to the uh, calculated weight of rods and fluids. So those would be a, a check, a reference. Um, and these we're not going to talk about very much but we'll use the pump intake pressure um, in the calculations uh, both from the pump card and from the um, uh, fluid level shot. So those are, those, are, those are turned on. We already saw those in blue in the previous slide here. Now, if you're going to go out and troubleshoot a well, uh, you probably ought to look and see if the well, what, how does the well producing condition compare to what you think it is, and that's the first step. And then the second step is look at the efficiency of the system and see if there's any kind of losses that you need to identify from mechanical friction and make uh, identify if you need to make an improvement in that. And you look at your pump, your pump card. Is your pump uh, efficient? Is it holding uh, valves working properly? Uh, if the pump has gas in it, that means your gas separator is not working as efficiently as you'd like. And this presentation is going to be primarily about the, the mechanical loading of the rods. And so we're going to talk about the mechanical loading uh, of the rods and not talk much about the pumping unit here in this, in this presentation. Uh, the, the analysis of the prime mover, you want to make sure it's not overheating. Uh, you can see the torque based on the horsepower, the KW of the, of the prime mover. If it's electric prime mover, then what you identify what's wrong in all these different steps and you uh, make a change to improve the operation of your well. And once the, ch the changes are made, then ideally you'd come back to the well in a couple weeks and verify what you recommended uh, work properly. That's called a follow-up analysis. And that's one of the ways that you become more, knowledge more knowledgeable about how things can work and how uh, you've changed from being just a data collector to a troubleshooter by seeing your recommend recommendation and fix a problem on a well. Uh, we've we have recorded for a long time the the measure of the load at the surface and the position, and the plot of load versus position is is what we call a surface dynamometer card. And uh, we use uh, Equimeter uses uh, a horseshoe load cell, so this is a 50k horseshoe load cell on the right. These are wireless ones, and this is a, a 30k load cell that's wired. And here we've stacked off the well, and we're going to put the 30k load cell between the carrier bar and the polish rod clamp. And this is three inches tall, tall, and we need to use something like a suitcase to stack off the well so that we can uh, put this load cell between the, the so the rods will rest on the load cell. So we need to make that gap. You can also use the polish rod transducers. The polish rod transducers. This is a wireless one, and wired. Uh, they measure the change in diameter of the polish rod, and their zero offset becomes the uh, setting the pump card on zero. We can talk about that more if someone has a question. Uh, this is the, the 50k load cell that would go up here if you had a spool and two spacers between uh, the washer on top and washer on the bottom, bottom, and then the spool. Then the 50k load cell can be just set up there in that gap without having to stack the well off. And then you can also use with the wired equipment uh, your, your own load cell that you may have for a pump off control system that's that's already on the well, but you then you'd use a special modified cable to get the either acceleration from the accelerometer special device or the acceleration from the polish load transducer. So this is how the surface dynamometer load measurements comes into our uh, software. Uh, this is a plot of the a surface dynamometer card. And so this is the load on the upstroke, 
and then this is a load on the downstroke and we uh, can we can acquire data for a period of time and acquire data, data at different sampling speeds um, and then we use something called the wave equation to uh, dynamically remove the the damping of the fluid on the rod string, weigh the rods uh, until we get to the bottom of the rod string and uh, with, we remove the weight of rods and fluid and the pump card represents, this is a pump card, and represents the the load that's applied to the bottom of the rod string. And we're going to talk a little bit about this pump card. Uh, and you can see that there's some reference lines on, on the screen. That's the, the, the maximum fluid load and the weight of rods and fluid. That's the measured weight of rods and fluid plus the pump load. This is the standing valve load measured versus the calculated weight of rods and fluid. And this is the maximum load line. If the pump intake pressure were zero, then the, the pump card would go up to that line. But since there's a fluid level in this well, the pump card is a distance away from that, that maximum load line. And we compare this uh, reference load line from the fluid level shot to the pump card when you see that they match. And that means that a lot of information that you've typed in uh, allows us to calculate this load line reference. And it matches up with what we measured. And that means it's a good match. And so this is, this is the first well we'll talk about later. It's called the dynamometer underscore normal. And so when I think about a pump card, I think that it's, it's, what, it's, it's a representation of the load that's applied to the, to the bottom of the rods by the pump uh, throughout a stroke. Now, this is a uh, display here that shows that we have a pump unit at the surface, and then we have a rod string going from the surface down to the pump. And we have, this is the trailing valve assembly, and the the trailing valve ball and seat, and here's our standing valve, and it's attached to the tubing. And um, this this pump card plot right here represents the the load that is calculated from this measured data uh, down down at the end at the end of the rod string. And if you were to look right here at the very top of the stroke, that load right there is 14,820 pounds. And the rod string here weighs 10,434 pounds. And if you were to subtract out the, the weight of rods in fluid from this measured point, well, let's see, 10,400 away from 14,000, that would be 4,800. And that load right there is like 6,280. So it's, it's, it's not simple math. The wave equation, uh, this is a, a wave here of the release of, an, of this acceleration force here. And we see this this force echoing up and down the rods. So this point here is an echo of that, and that point there is an echo of that minimum load. And and the wave equation that was that was developed back in the 1960s by uh, Sam Gibbs is what is used pretty much in the industry throughout the industry to take this load that's measured and calculate a diagnostic load at the bottom of the rod string. And so this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about these loads here on the surface and pump card. But we're going to need, we use the wave equation to come up with this downhole pump card load. Now, when you think about the pump and you look at the pump card, the, 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 the load on the downstroke, so here's a, here's a, this is a downstroke load right here. And this is a plunger moving on the downstroke. It's moving down uh, from 145 inches to zero. And this is the upstroke load right here. And it's moving from approximately zero to a maximum stroke of about 156 inches on the upstroke. And you can see this load line is fairly flat here on the upstroke. And this load line here on the downstroke is fairly flat. And this is the expansion of fluids on this side. And this is a compression of fluids on this side. So that's what's happening during the stroke. So we start here, we expand the fluids, the standing valve opens, we carry the fluids on the upstroke with the trailing valve closed, standing valve open, we get to the top of the stroke, standing valve closed, closes at that point, and the pump becomes a compressor and compresses the fluid inside the inside the pump chamber. We'll talk about that. And once the trailing valve opens, then the plunger moves on the downstroke to the barrel with very little change in load acting across the pump, across the plunger on the downstroke. And this is um, a low viscosity well. So if we had high viscosity fluids, we'd see we see this, this, this load line probably lower on the downstroke. 
and higher on the upstroke due to viscosity friction forces across the, across the pump. But when the gravity is more than about 20, you don't see much viscosity effects, and there's no uh, restriction uh, through the pump. You don't see any, any effects of that. So these load lines match up pretty, really pretty close. Okay, so what we're saying here on the downstroke, when the fluid load is zero, um, that means that when we use the wave equation to come down to the end of the rod string, we don't see any load, and so that's what we see. We don't see any load. Load's close to zero. And that's basically what we're saying here. And then on the upstroke, we have the pressure on top of the plunger, which is uh, the tubing pressure plus the tubing fluid weight, true vertical depth, down to the discharge of the pump. And then below the plunger is the intake pressure, and that difference in pressure acting across the plunger acts on the area of the pump, and so the load, the, the, the height of the pump card, is this discharge pressure minus intake pressure times area of the pump. And we see that it's fairly constant right here. It's a fairly constant load. And that means that the intake pressure from this point to that point and the discharge pressure from that point to that point are fairly constant uh, throughout, throughout the upstroke. All right, so this is, this is a example of a downhole pump card measured with a downhole load cell. Uh, Sandia, back in the 1990s, uh, put a downhole load cell in six different wells. And this is the recorded pump load at the, at the, below the weight bars above the pump with a downhole load cell. And so these, these labels here, A through D, represents uh, things that happen throughout the stroke. And so when you look at this pump card, you should be able to identify the corners, the corners of the pump card. So here's the lower left-hand corner. Here's the upper left-hand corner. Here's the upper right-hand corner. Here's the lower right-hand corner. And what you see is that when the load line is flat, that means that one, one valve is on this, falls on the seat, and the other valve is open, and there's a differential pressure here of the fluid load acting across the pump. So here we're carrying the fluid load on the upstroke from B to C. That's what this says. And the fluid load, the height of the pump card, is pressure on top minus pressure on bottom times area of the pump. And that's that load line that we calculate based on um, how this pump's working. Now on the downstroke, we see that the pump card has zero, well, not quite zero load. Uh, it has a little bit of negative load there and a little bit of positive load there, but it it's pretty much close to zero, so that's the that's the differential pressure that's causing a little bit of pressure drop going into the pump, and so we see a little bit of difference in pressure. But it, this is what we measured with the downhole load cell, and so this is no load acting on the pump on the downstroke. And from from A to B, that is where we expand the fluid, and both balls are on the seat. And so here, the trailing valve ball is on the seat; it was open from this point to that. And here the fluid expands and drops the pressure below in the pump chamber right here, below the intake pressure, and that causes at point B, the standing valve, to pop off the seat. And then at the top of the stroke, when we stop, to, stop, to start back down, the, the, the standing valve ball that's off the seat here falls on the seat, and the suck rod pump becomes a compressor, and the pressure is increased inside this pump chamber until at point D that the pressure below the trailing valve ball is slightly higher than the pressure above and that knocks the the with pressure opens the valve and the, and the and the fluid gets discharged from inside the pump chamber into the into the barrel now this is uh, where those downhole load cells were ran and this is where the the pump card we're seeing right here was was acquired with the downhole load cell back in uh, I'm not sure. I think now it built the tool in 86, and I think this was acquired back in 1994 or 1996. I don't see the, see the date on this screen here. But this is this is the data. So here's a measure date at the surface with the down with right below the polish rod. And then here's the, the next taper, next rod taper, or the 7 8 rod taper. And this is the right above the weight bars right here. And then there's there's our pump card right here. So here's our down pump card. And at the exact same time this data was acquired with the downhole load cell, I call this a Sandia pump card, then at the same time we used an echometer 
a portable well analyzer to acquire the surface data and then we have calculated and this is the same the same pump card about the same uh, amount of gas in the pump uh, a, a good a good match on the loads on the upstroke and the downstroke and the pump card here that we calculate with the Nicometer uh, TWM or TAM software uh, matches up with the theoretical loads and matches up with what was measured. And so that's there's an example that that this example right here is one example we'll talk about later in the presentation. And what we use we can use this surface card for things like looking at the rod string loading, the pump unit loading, uh, pump problems and excessive frictions and we use the downhole pump card for things like incomplete pump fillage and gas inter which is gas interference whether the tubing is anchored or not and things like that. We'll talk about that more throughout this this presentation. Now one other point, one of the things that got me so interested in the um, Sandia data was that Amrata has, I worked for Amrata has prior to, prior to 2000 we'd, we'd volunteered one of our wells to, to run the downhole load cell in the well, and the Amrata Hess had their own diagnostic software, and our diagnostic software would calculate the pump card sitting on zero. And when we looked at the initial data from the San Sandia guys, their pump card was shifted below the zero load line by a, a buoyancy force, and uh, they didn't match up. And so I spent about two two years working back and forth between Queen Sandia trying to understand. What the problem was, and that's a whole other presentation. But it came it came about that there's a, a thing called a true load and an effective load, and we, an echo meter uses the effective loads. And so the initial Sandia loads were plotted as true loads, and now they're if you go back and pull the data up, they're typically plotted as as effective loads. And you can adjust that if you want to select a certain size rod. This prediction there's a paper that's referenced here. Uh, you're welcome to, to, to get that from SPE on the uh, calculation of the pump card with the wave equation. When Sam Gibbs saw that wave equation, he said, I'm going to make the wave equation simple to solve, so I'm going to uh, leave out gravity, and that's going to cause the pump card to shift below the below the zero load line. So the reason it's shifted below zero, based on the 1963 paper, is that the initial solution was there's no gravity in the wave equation. All right, now this is starting to get into the main part of the, the presentation of today. So here we've, this is a, a slide from Gibson and Swain that was presented back in the 70s. And they talked about a building block of loads. And, and this is the way to rise in air. And this is the buoyancy force. The way to rise in fluid is the way to rise in air minus the buoyancy force. So here's our way to rise in fluid. And that's that load reference line right there. And we call it the standing valve load line. And when you add the, the fluid load on to the weight rise in air, that's the, this is a fluid load right here, and that becomes the weight rise in fluid plus the fluid load, and that's the trailing valve load line. And another reference point is a minimum polished rod load and the maximum polished rod load. And all this is related back to the zero, to the zero load line. So these are the uh, six basic loads. Uh, the counterbalance effect line is the effect of the weights and cranks at the polished rod. We call it a counterbalance effect load. So that's where this initially this initially started from, and and really started out because back in the 1960s and 70s, people were using um, surface loads to analyze wells. And it was before they had laptop computers, and they didn't have wave equations like they carry around in their pocket with a, a high speed lightweight laptop computer. And so there wasn't any way to do that very easily. And so they just looked at the surface loads they measured at the well. So here is the same reference, um, normal well, and I've labeled on here the peak polish rod load, the trailing valve load measured, the weight rods in fluid, the maximum fluid load, the fluid load based on the fluid level, and the zero load line. And we use uh, the load range for calculating stresses on the rod string. Peak, peak polish rod load minus minimum load is the rod stresses. And so here's our here is our zero load line on this on this example here. So our pump card sits on zero, no load, uh, acting across the trailing valve on the downstroke. So here's the downstroke. And then here's our peak load. The peak load right here is a maximum load through a stroke that you select. And here it's showing is twenty thousand 
pounds or 20.45 thousand K pounds. And that's that point right there. Now, this peak load is due to an acceleration force, which this is acceleration force, applied at the surface so that we can pick up the, the, the pump load, the static pump load, at the pump. And so there's our, our, our we call it the F1 force. And that came out of APR P11L. And then here's our minimum pump load. And this minimum load comes from releasing the pump load that's on the rods. And so here, from this point to this point, release, we're releasing the pump load on the downstroke. And here's the weight of rods and fluid. And this distance here, this it goes below the weight of rods and fluid because we've now created a acceleration force by releasing the pump load and that and the faster we go the more uh, lower the minimum load will be and it's a minimum load throughout a cycle and I put it and the, and the pump, minimum pump loads right here so when you look at this example here we have the, the, the peak peak load and that the acceleration force to pick up the pump load on the upstroke and then here's the F2 force the, the acceleration force for created when you release the pump load on the downstroke and this well right here has a ratio of peak load to minimum load of about 0.25 and based on experience if you have that ratio less than that for a well this depth uh, you tend to have more sucker rod failures due to rod on tubing wear. Uh, ox, there's a paper I didn't reference that that we referenced previously in one of the other prior ask echo meter presentations and this ratio is recommended to not exceed uh, 0.1 per every 2500 foot of pump depth and so in this well the depth was about 5000 feet the the limit is that's one point point one nine and so we have 0.25 it's greater than 0.19 and so uh, we're not pumping too fast if we pump faster that would increase the faster strokes per minute. That would cause the peak load to go up higher and the minimum load to go down lower. And we start to approach this limit and tend to have an increased rod on tubing wear and increased rod failures. Now these are the equations here. And this is a standing valve load. Uh, weight of rods in air um, minus the buoyancy force. This is the pump intake pressure, which is the, the True vertical height of fluid times the tubing fluid gradient um, plus the this is the casing casing gas weight plus the casing pressure. This is a pump and the pump discharge pressure is a true vertical pump depth times a specific gravity of tubing fluid times a, a gradient of fresh water plus the tubing pressure. This is the fluid load, which is the pressure acting across the pump, which is a discharge pressure my intake times the area of the pump is a fluid load and they add the fluid load to the weight of rods in fluid that becomes a trialing valve load and so these are our standing valve and trialing valve load are, are two of our reference loads so here's our standing valve load and let me miss this here so usually we, st we stop about a, f a fourth of the way or so from the bottom of the stroke and we come to a a gentle stop and we don't jerk the brake which causes if we jerk the brake it'll bounce the ball off the seat and pick up a little extra load so usually we come to a gentle stop um, and that load line right there is a weight of rods and fluid and we would like this load line that we calculate to match what we measure and that would be a check that we check and confirm that they, they match um, and this is the equation weight of rods and air times this uh, ratio of the density of density of water divided by the density of steel is at 0.218. You take that times the tubing fluid gradient, and that's the buoyancy force. So the standing valve load, weight of rise in air minus the buoyancy force, and that's that line right there as a reference. Now this is a trailing valve load, and we we come to a gradual stop stop on the upstroke, and this is the uh, weight of rise in fluid plus the fluid load from the pump intake pressure at the fluid level and uh, when we come to a stop uh, we'll, we'll see an example here in just a minute how the load will leak off because of clearances between the, the plunger and the barrel so this is a, this is the load it should be 
and it's going to quickly uh, drop off by the difference. There's a pressure tr above the plunger and below, the intake pressure below, and the tubing discharge pressure above, and that pressure above is going to push the uh, fluid into the chamber and equalize the pressure over time. Um, so this is the the two equations here. This is the height of the pump card to fluid load based on the based on the differential pressure acting across the pump. And we take the the, the this is our weight rods in air minus the buoyancy plus our uh, fluid load and that's this uh, reference little line right here, the traveling valve load. Now this is a valve test in TAM and it's displaying the trailing valve load here and here's our here's our calculated reference as a maximum. You can see the maximum is a little higher than what we measured because this well has a little bit of a fluid above the pump and so this line right here is a little bit below that dash line and this dash line right here is the weight of rods and fluid calculated and so here's our calculated line 8013 and here's when we stopped on the downstroke there's our our measured load that we stopped and normally this load line is going to be flat if there's if there's no uh, leakage past the standing valve and if it leaks it's going to go up and uh, slippage should show this line to, to start to drop like see we waited a while and right about this point we start to see a drop in load and what Dr. Podio found which is a, a good observation was that when the pumps not full it takes a period of time for the fluid to leak past, past the through the clearances into the pump chamber, and then once the pressures, the fluid is leaked past, and the, we start to see a differential release of the pressures, we start to see this drop in load. So we'll we'll see another example of this. All right, so here the, the counterbalance effect load line. This is talking about uh, we stop with the cranks level on the upstroke, and we weigh the rod string with the load cell, and we and we uh, start to release the, the brake and the slippage is letting the fluid load drop off and once the, the fluid load drops off to this point right here when we release the brake then the, then the measurement that we're making with our load cell matches matches the uh, effect of the weights from the crank the load effect from the crank and the weights uh, when they're at 90 on the upstroke and so here we, we measured this with the load cell and this is an APR P11 equation that, that would cap, be used to calculate that line. All right, now we talk, when we start to talk about a pump card, the pump card has, has again, three reference load lines. The, the pump card sets on zero on the downstroke. That's one reference load line. And it has the fluid load line calculated from the fluid level. That's, that's the, the load line that should match up with the pump card. If the pump, the well is drawn down to no pump intake pressure, which is there's always going to be some pressure, then this 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 pump card load line shouldn't shouldn't go up above this FO max load line if there's no mechanical friction. So this load line is the top, the maximum, if the pump intake pressure is zero. So you should see the pump card plot between zero and FO max. And this is the calculations of how these are calculated. All right, so here's our here's our a plot showing the valve test versus time and the surface card and the and the pump card and well where are our, our reference load lines so here's our zero load line for dy zero load line for dynamometer data right there and here's um, I didn't draw this down pull this down far enough so there's no zero reference here the peak polish rod load is that peak right there there's our minimum load right there the counterbalance effect line is if if the weights it's going to be right to the middle, but there's not, you really can't, we didn't measure here, so you don't have a measured counterbalance effect line, but it's, it's usually about halfway between the trailing valve load and the standing valve load. Standing valve load is right here, which is the weight of rods and fluid, and if you notice that we stopped right there, the measured line, the measured load in red is equal to or very close to the calculated green dash line that you typed in, your, your, rod string and your your oil and water production is used in to calculate that dash green line which is the theoretical weight of rods and fluid and then if you add if you add to that the maximum fluid load line that's this line right here and you can see right here we're a little bit below that where we stopped and that's what we measured a little bit below because as well as it has a little bit of fluid above the pump and here is our fluid load line on the up upstroke fo fo from our 
uh, fluid level shot, and then this line right here is a maximum. And this wheel has a little bit of mechanical friction, so it's going all the way to FO max. And so, in this case, it's above FO from the fluid level. It, it's not matching up, but it's a little bit higher because there's some mechanical friction. Here's some mechanical friction on the downstroke, and here's mechanical friction on the up. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is that notice that when we stopped on the upstroke right here, and the pump was filled with liquid, then we see this immediate drop in load because of pressure slipping between the clearances, or liquid slipping between the clearances, and it's reducing the pressure below, uh, it's increasing the pressure inside the pump chamber, and differential pressure is dropping, and this change in load, we use this to calculate the, the, the slippage or the leakage rate, and if you don't have any extra mechanical friction, which just appears to show we have extra mechanical friction, uh, the this load line will tend not will tend to drop right down to the weight rods and fluid if there's no mechanical friction. If it doesn't drop down to to the weight rods and fluid, then there's extra friction acting on the rod spring that's not accounted for. We call that residual friction. Now this test shows that there's almost no extra friction acting on the rods, and we waited here from 150 seconds to about 270 seconds right there. So it took it took a while. It took about uh, two minutes for the for the pressure to equalize above and below the plunger to let the fluid load leak off. Um, this is a slide that shows down the tubing. Here's our tubing pressure. Here's our tubing fluid gradient. A true vertical depth times the tubing fluid gradient plus the tubing pressure equals the discharge pressure. And that's the pressure on top of the plunger. And this is the pressure on the bottom of the plunger. And that that's Pressure on top minus pressure on bottom times the area of the pump is a, is the height of the pump card. Now, when we look at the pump card, here's our pump card right here. Here's our fluid load reference line. And the, the distance that the pump card is away from FO max represents the distance from approximately the top of the gas free fluid level all the way to the surface. So this is the lift that the pump has to provide, I said it wrong, this is the lift right here the pump has to provide, that's this distance right here, and that's this distance right here, equivalent, they're kind of equivalent, and then this distance right here is the pump intake pressure provided by the equivalent gas rate pump height of fluid above the pump. And so this is our, the, the more the higher the level is, the farther away the pump card gets away from FO max, the uh, lower the pump intake pressure, the closer the pump card gets to FO max on the upstroke. All right, now this is an example here of showing the pump card height and length versus a surface card. And so here we have a fluid load that is the highest when the pump intake pressure is the lowest. And if the pump intake pr were pressure were higher, we'd see a lower fluid load and we'd also see less rod stretch, so we see a slightly longer stroke. And so we can see as the fluid load comes up, the pump stroke gets longer and the fluid load gets less. And that's the relationship between intake pressure and load. The, the lower the pump intake pressure, the shorter the, sh the shorter the stroke. Okay. All right. Now, when you look at the surface card and you have anchored tubing, the pump card has a vertical line when the, on the side, the left-hand side, when the tubing is anchored. And we, and this is a TWM screen right here, but we show the same thing in TAM. And so if you look right here, there's that is the spring constant for the rod string. And the rod string, the steel rod string, acts like a, a giant spring. And if we add a certain amount of weight, then the, the, the rod string stretches elastically. And if we double the weight, we double the stretch. And we triple the weight, we triple the stretch. And if we were to plot the, the, the weight change versus the stroke inches change, it would plot along this line. And that is this rod string acting like a spring. And, it, and this spring constant, 402 pounds, would match up along that line. And when it unstretches to reduce the fluid load, then, it, then you'd see the same line if there's no gas interference. You see a, a vertical line right here. So, th so we also can put these reference low lines on the sides of the pump card. Uh, the, the spring constant for the rods and the spring constant for the tubing. 
Now this is a this is a well that has anchor tubing and it's a rotaflex pumping unit. And what we're seeing here is that we've got anchor tubing and we see that this tubing anchor line and the pump card line don't quite match. And normally when you have a little bit of slippage that causes this vertical load line this this uh, pump card measure line to, to, to be a little bit past past the, the tubing stretch the rod stretch line or the tubing stretch line this tubing stretch line right here so usually when you have anchor tubing it doesn't match this line which would be the line it would have if tubing's anchored you see a little bit of movement due to slippage and this distance right here is slippage and this distance here is is maybe gas but it's also some slippage these two lines should be parallel if there's no gas in the pump. Now this example here is another example It's anchored but not set. So this this pump doesn't have an anchor and you notice that the, that the, when, when we go to pick up the fluid load right here that the tubing moves and that's due to releasing the fluid load and it moves back down when we when we compress the fluid inside the pump. Now if it's unanchored, why isn't this line right here on that line? That's due to slippage. So this is slippage, and this distance from here to here is movement and lost downhole stroke due to tubing movement. So we can use these annotated reference load reference load lines of tubing tubing stretch and rod stretch to to plot them on the surface and the pump card. Uh, this is an example out of the, the Southwest Point Short Course, I said 1954, it's 1958. And it's, it's using the weight of rods and fluid to classify the loads. And so we run away to well, and back in 1958, they didn't have a downhole pump card that they could calculate, so they just had a surface measurement of load and position. And it's going to say, are the valve load, valve test loads normal? Are they are the valve test loads of weight rods and fluid less than the rod load, or more? And so here we'd say, well, it's less than the rod load. Uh, is it a rod part? Is so what? What's the what's the problem? And so here's here's the, the the chart that you can use to troubleshoot the well. And this is a paper that has five different flow charts that use the surface measure data to troubleshoot the well. I really like this this concept and. It's a good paper to, to, to if you're interested in to, to, to read. So here's some valve test examples. So here we have a, a trailing valve load test versus time, and a standing valve load test versus time. And this is a one stroke and two strokes. And so notice that we stopped right here, and the weight of rods and fluid red measured matches up with the uh, theoretical weight of rods um, calculated based on what you typed into the software, and so normally, if it was a leaky standing valve, you see this load go up. So this is a this is a standing valve that's not leaking. It's holding the fluid in the tubing and it's working properly. Now here, this is a standing valve that shows a load gain. And so we stopped right here. And normally, we 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 color the 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 screen a gray a gray color. I guess that's not a color, but that's a it's a gray shade to uh, identify that the accelerons accelerons Barometer output is the rods aren't moving, and so in this case, the the pump leaked so much right here that the so that it didn't even it didn't even show it gray. So the accelerometer is still seeing the rods moving as the plunger moves because there's a, a, a pretty leaky standing valve. Now, so this is an example of a leaky standing valve, and it shouldn't be going up. So this is a probably needs probably its production has come has dropped you're carrying a fairly high fluid level because this load line is very far away from that line and so they probably have lost production and and they probably could pull the well and and replace the standing valve and and increase production from this well now this is a trailing valve right here we stopped and the trailing valve load leaks off well why is it leaking off well th this operator ran a pump clearance of six thousandths of an inch that means that the ID of the pump minus the OD of the plunger, the total distance is, is six thousandths of an inch, and that, that makes it easier for the the more the bigger the number, the more uh, 
slippage can occur versus time, and this li this line is is dropping off with uh, slippage as the pressure fluid leaks past the plunger into the barrel. Now here's another test, and this this one this pump had uh, this was primarily water, and the pump clearance was a nine thousandths inch of clearance, and the viscosity was fairly low, and so here we stop, and this is a this is a low lost with nine thousandths pump clearance. Uh, this is this isn't uh, a problem. This is just what the the design uh, is made, and this is how much how much loss and load you have over this five second time interval. And this is a trial and valve test that the pump's worn out. And so when we here we try to pick up the load and immediately we stop the load leak drawing back off. And so this is a very leaky worn out pump. And you'd call it, I prefer to say this is a leaky pump plunger assembly because we don't know whether it's the plunger or the barrel or the ball or the seat that's damaged. But this is showing us a sudden, a sudden loss in load for the, for the trial and valve test. Now this is the second or the first reference we put on the, the title slide that talks about pump car reference lines. And if you have a reference line where the pump card is flat, that means there's no pump action. And so you can have the trailing valve stuck open, or you can have a, a deep rod part. Uh, there's no transfer of load from the trailing valve to the standing valve if you have a deep rod part or a shallow rod part. You can have the tubing blown dry. That means you have uh, wet rods and air in your tubing. If you have a tubing blown dry, if you have um, a deep rod part, then you would measure the wet rods and fluid if you stop. If you have a shallow rod part, well, you wouldn't measure the wet rods and fluid. You weigh less than the wet rods and fluid. And if you have a standing valve stuck open, um, you might weigh the wet rods and fluid plus the fluid load because there's no there's no uh, transfer of the trailing valve fluid load onto the tubing on the downstroke. So here these same load lines are plotted on a pump card. You can see here it looks like we've got unanchored tubing and here is where the pump card would plot if it's a shallow, a shallow part and here's where it would plot if it's a trailing valve stuck open or a deep rod part and here's where it would plot if it's the tubing blown dry this is the way the rods measure the surface in air, and we subtracted out the way the rods in fluid. So this is the missing buoyancy force right here. And here, the standing valve stuck open. So uh, during the stroke, we're, we're, we're weighing the, the, the way the rods in fluid plus the pump load on the rods during on the upstroke and the downstroke because the standing valve stuck open. So this is an example. It's a trash sticks to standing valve open. We'll look at that in a minute. And you can see along here, here's the, the, the time, uh, strokes versus time. This is, this is these strokes are labeled. And you can see stroke number 26 here, and then 20, 27, 28. And then on 29, we picked up the, the, the weight of rods and fluid plus a pump load. But since the standing valve is stuck open to the trash, we didn't transfer the load on the downstroke. So here the, the load's not trans it's being transferred here, but here it's not being transferred because the standing valve is stuck open and there's no transfer of the fluid load to the tubing on the downstroke. And so we can see here that there's six strokes that um, only have the standing valve uh, that is not carrying the load, trailing valve is carrying the load for the entire stroke. So this is this is an example where when we look at these two this is the same data for the, this is the same data so if we look at this data right here and we plot it as a surface card and pump card this is the plot of the data as it were if it were measured with a horseshoe load cell but it was actually measured with a polished rod transducer and the polished rod transducer the, the the way we determine the zero offset is we always set the pump card on zero so here, this would be the pump card load zeroed, and it should be positioned up here. And so when you don't have a load cell, these, these six reference loads all end up plotting right here on the zero load line. If you have a horseshoe load cell or your load cell, donut load cell, or um, then, then, we're gonna then we can actually calculate the loads based on 
the actual loads, but the PRT, all the loads end up plotting on the zero load line, and you know that one of these problems exists in your well, but it's difficult to, to troubleshoot, except that you can notice here that notice that the pump card isn't going, the loads aren't going down on the downstroke, so there's no transfer load to the standing valve on the downstroke on these example cards right here. Alright, now this is this is an example here where when we look at this with the surface card, it's full on stroke number eleven. And then stroke number thirteen, there's no fluid load. And so the pump card, the surface card is is plotting around the reference load line called weight rods and fluid. So this is weight rods and fluid, and that's what we're picking up, weight rods and fluid. But that's on the upstroke and the downstroke, and so the pump card plots around the zero load line. And well, what happened is at stroke number 12? Well, you can't tell. You don't know whether the rods parted or whether the trailing valve stuck open because you can't see stroke number 12. But if you look at the data versus time, then you can see that right here on stroke number 12 that the trailing valve didn't seat and it didn't pick the loads up. So this is this is right there it is a stroke over here that didn't quite trailing valve is having problems and that's usually if you're having problems with solids you see a stroke that here's a stroke that had a problem and here's some more strokes that are working uh, reasonably okay the pumps fill with liquid and the valves are open and closing like that like you would expect and then we get over to this stroke 13 we're going to see that uh, from then on all we're doing is going to carry the weight of rods and fluid and we're just going to see continually see uh, pump cards that are that are centered around the zero load line and we're going to see these surface loads drop to the weight rods and fluid and so now the trash stuck the trailing valve open and we we'll pull the pump we'll, we might not pull the pump we'd probably want to tag it to see if we could shake the trash out and then if we can't then we'll probably have to pull a pump but in this case it's a uh, it's trash stuck the trailing valve open now this is a well if you look at the data this is a standing valve load and we can see here that the surface card is plotting around the weight rods and fluid so based on that you'd think well all we're carrying here is weight rods and fluid and when we look at the pump card it's a flat pump card sitting on zero so this is an example of of a a, a deep rod part right at the pump the pull the pull rod came unscrewed and so went out and weighed this well the pump card plots when we subtract weight rods and fluid out it's plots right on the zero load line and what one of the things that's interesting about that is that if there's no pump, there's no stretch. And so if there's no stretch, then the, the plunger velocity and the polish rod velocity are the same. And so the so the this is an analysis plot that shows a plunger velocity in red. It's a little higher right there. And the plunger velocity in red, it's a little more negative right here. So it's not exactly the same. And so what you what you see is when you have when you have a a, a, a deep rod part, the plunger velocity actually is higher on the upstroke and more negative on the downstroke. And the downhole pump stroke here in this case is about 1.6 longer inches longer than the surface stroke due to over travel, due to acceleration of the rods. Now this is an interesting one because this is a well where you look at all of the loads that you measure throughout the stroke, the plot of all the loads throughout the stroke, all of the loads plot below the weight of rods and fluid. So if you were to look at this surface measure data, you'd say, well, I'm missing some rod weight because every load I measured is less than the weight of rods and fluid. And then when you don't tell your software you're missing some rods, the software subtracts out the entire weight of rods and fluid, and now the pump card is plotted negative below the zero load line by the missing weight of rods and fluid. And so this is this this is an example of where we have a rod part. And the rod part, we can say well we're missing about 3,536 pounds of load. And that means that some of these rods here are missing because we've got 20, 275 feet of inch and a half rods and we've got 2,350 feet of three quarter inch rods. And so we need to get rid of all the weight bars and uh, about, well, somewhere close to half of the three-quarter inch rods to account for 
3,536 pounds of weight rods in fluid. And this is the weight rods in air right here. And so if we adjust the rod string and remove just the right amount of rods, then we will see that our pump card will then plot on zero and we'll know approximately the, the depth to where the rod part is. And this is the actual depth to the rod part. And so you can see if we have the, the correct rod string that we weighed, uh, that we weighed with this data, then the weight of rods and fluid that we're weighing should go pretty much the midpoint of the rod string. That's what it's doing right here. The mid midpoint of, the, of this, the center of mass of this surface dynamic card. And then we subtract out this rod string from this measured load. The pump card is going to sit on zero because there's no pump attached. And it's only the weighted rods on the up and fluid on the upstroke, weighted rods and fluid on the downstroke. So it's a flat pump card sitting on zero. All right. So it's, you can use the, the pump card to identify and troubleshoot problems in a well. The if when the pump card plots as a flat load line, it could be the trailing valve stuck open, a deep rod part, a shallow rod part, the tubing is dry, or the trailing valve is stuck open. I didn't show tubing is dry, but I, I should have put an example in, but I, I didn't do that. Um, when the when the when it's the pump card pumps okay, it's going to plot between the zero load line and the FO from the fluid level load line, and that's a that's a representative pump card. Now, if you use the polish rod transducer, uh, any one of these uh, examples here will be a flat line on zero. And it's difficult to diagnose. So if you were to send ethometer technical support a question and say, what's wrong with my pump? I've got a flat pump card. Then technical support pin would probably send you an email back saying, well, you really can't tell. It's one of these five things. And you probably ought to use your horseshoe load cell to weigh it and actually see how the loads plot with respect to zero load line. All right, so that's, that's the presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. Gustavo, do we have any questions? Yes, we do have questions, Lynn. And let me start up here. Uh, John had just asked him, what do you look when you analyze the perforations and the downhole gas separator? What do you look at there? Well, that's a, that's, that, that question is for gas interference. And so that's going to be a future topic for, for the future. But um, let me see if I've got, I don't think I have an example. Let me see. If we go to TAM, uh, I think that might be TAM right there. Here's TAM. So. If this, if you look at this well right here, this this shape right here is gas compression, and so, and this from here to here we talked about last week is how much free gas is in the pump when the trailing valve opens from this point to that point, from that blue line to that black line. This is how much free gas entered the pump chamber. So you see a compression curve if you have incomplete pump flage on the right hand side of the pump card. Now that's that would be the the question he asked. And now with respect to at the perforations, if you were to set your pump, one of the problems is is that when I start thinking about wells now, I've changed my brain to start thinking about unconventional wells. And so it's very difficult to set the pump below the perfs on an unconventional well because the horizontal well. So in the when I was in the field and in the office from when I worked at Amarai S. We had vertical wells, and so we, our practice was to set the pump below the purse because the gas would go up and the liquids would go down and our pump would be full of liquid. In a horizontal well, you don't have that option. You have to worry about gas, gas interference. It's a big problem. You have to worry about that. So that's something you have to consider and, and run a dental gas separator if you have a horizontal well that's an unconventional well. So hope that answered your question. Yeah, I think I was asking for the performance of the downhole gas separator. Yeah, we'll talk. Non, about, there's a we'll talk about that in the future. So we'll we'll talk about separator performance in the future. And there's a paper on the web page that talks about gas separation performance. So, okay. Uh, Tom's asking, 
Is there any way to account for frictional force due to the well deviation when using the wave equation to calculate pump load? So, so when you enter the deviation survey into the software, um, we take out the, the uh, we only include the true vertical wave of the rod string. And so if, there's, if, there, if there was no mechanical friction and your, well, and your rod string wasn't vertical, then the pump card still should sit on the zero load line for the for the TAM software. And so the mechanical friction is going to cause the pump card to plot below zero when there's mechanical friction that's not handled by the wave equation. And it's going to show the pump card to go above above the FO from the fluid level if there's mechanical friction on the upstroke. So so the answer would be you see the pump card outside the uh, the limits of the zero load line and FO from the fluid level if there's um, mechanical friction present. Okay. And I have a question from the private chat. Say, is the wave equation in TAM or TWM the same developed by Sam Gibbs? I think that's when you were in slide number eight. Or is it a modified version? And if it's modified, what was considered for that correction? Uh, okay. So, so that, that's a that's a pretty complicated question. Um, and the answer is, the wave equation is the same equation. Okay, it's a wave equation, but the way that it's, it's solved inside TWM and TAM is with um, finite differences, and that that's that's called that's called uh, take one point and the next point, and you take the change, and this the change is like the slope, and so that's a that's a that's a a finite difference calculation method. And they use a different method. Uh, Sam Gibbs uses a, a different method to solve the wave equation than using finite differences. So that's that's a that's a simple answer, but, and it's really more complicated than that. We have more questions, and uh, Aaron Walsh is asking, Helen, given that the wave uh, through the rod string is speed dependent, if you run the pumps low enough. Would it be possible to dampen the wave enough to get a flat surface car where the top lines up with the buoyancy road weight plus the FO and the bottom lines lines up to, with the buoyancy road weight? I think it's not accounting for friction here. Okay, okay. Uh, so I don't, I, I need to. That's slide number 24, maybe. Let's go to slide 24 and look at that. So let me bring the PowerPoint back up. Let's go down a little farther. This is a vertical well. And um, this is slide 27. And since there's no mechanical friction, the, the pump card plots on the, the, the zero load line because we've measured this information right here on the downstroke with, with a load cell. And then we use the wave equation to subtract out the fluid dampening on the rods, along with the weight of rods in fluid, and, and we treat the rod string as a giant spring. And this piece right here is this line right there. And, and this compression is this right here. So, so this pump card sits on zero because we properly handled the weight of rods in fluid, the correct weight of rods in fluid, the correct fluid friction on the rods called dampening, and there wasn't any extra mechanical friction. So we're, we're doing that with the wave equation. Okay, we have more questions. Um, Sam's asking, Helen, many of our dynos we run, whether the driver or with TAM shows the angles on the side of the pump car. Right. It's very rare that we actually have an anchor tubing uh, because they have anchorage tubing, that's what he meant. Right. They do have anchorage tubing because they confirm that when they pull out the well. Right. And the anchor is typically very close to 30 feet to 150 feet from the pump. Why do we see these lines? Slippage. Okay. And, and another thing is be, okay, so now let's, let's, let's look at, um, let me go back to that, this, this card right here. Okay. So this, this is a, this is a plot of a, a worn pump. Okay, that's not anchored, even though it's it's supposed to be anchored, but the anchor's not set. So, if there was no slippage, this calculated pump card load line 
would be along that line right there that's unanchored tubing. But the the idea, let me see if I can get this to to to, to run here and I'll stop it. Okay. Okay, what I want to show you is, is right there when the standing valve opens, and let me see if I can't pop this up to full screen screen here. Okay, here we are right here. And what I want to show you is that is that the it's moving and this distance here that it moves up is based on this red line and we don't really know with the wave equation um, the, the theoretical slippage other than based on the pump clearances and so in the software we we calculate the slippage and if the pump clearances are more open or if the speed is slower this this is a fairly slow stroke then the pump card starts to move away from this red line right here due to clearances and so if you have a if you have a an anchor tubing but you run 9000 clearance and you pump it at two strokes a minute it's going to look like a leaky pump like a worn out pump but it's not a worn out pump it's just that the 9000 clearance lets the prevents the fluid load from being picked up during the upstroke it just leaks so you have to have some some if you have really open clearances or one out pump um, this this occurs and so here this 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 pump card is leaning over because of two reasons one because of slippage because the pumps warm and if you run open clearances like nine thousandths five thousand six thousandths clearance then the pump card leans over and that's that's what causes that okay uh we have another question on the slide 25. Slide 25. Now, one, one, more, one more thought there. If you guys have a question about the, what, if it's anchored or not, uh, it's you're always welcome to send us your data uh, and someone can help you with it. Um, you don't send us all your data, but just send us an example. And one of us could be, would be glad to answer your question about that, okay? That's right. All right, so here's slide 25. Yeah, why would that... Why we do not see a standing valve leakage from this test? Can we measure the standing valve leakage? Well, uh, we don't calculate it, and so let's go. Let's go to a different slide. The second one, right there. This is a leaky standing valve. Okay, and so the change in load versus time um, represents the how fast the rods unstretch. We could calculate this because it represents plunger movement. The, if, the, if the rods stretch and due to the load changing, we can calculate it. We just never have calculated how much, what this represents. We've always just had these two points, this point and that point for the trailing valve, and we compare, compare that load to that load, and if the loads decrease, then we calculate how much the Slippage has to be to make that load, that calculation match. We have another question related to uh, the valve. So, do we use the same way or technique to do a valve check, no matter if, if it's shallow or deep? Um, do the, uh, the the load decline trace is it similar? Is this correct? Okay. The, when you have a when you have a, a shallow well. The you're typically pumping fast, or not always, but you're usually pumping fast. You have a short stroke, and it's pretty hard to stop it on the upstroke because you're going fast. The faster the well goes, the harder it's to stop. The shorter the stroke is, the harder it's to stop. Uh, do you agree with what I'm saying, Ken? It's just a little harder when you're to have a shallow well pumping fast. I would say that it's a little bit harder because it's a short stroke and it's going fast. Um, and often the shallow wells they tend not to have have very good breaks. Uh, so you need a good break and you need to practice is what I would say. Yeah, you ought to, you, if you really want to do a valve test, it's the same procedure. You just need to probably practice. Uh, Adam is asking on the slide 28. Okay, 28. So the second standing valve test is stabilized at a load a little higher than the previous one. Wondering what causes this. Well, I, I probably didn't stop it very good right there. 
you know, I probably I probably stopped a little bit fast and jerked the brake. And if you jerk the brake and it bounces the rod string a little bit, then the the the, the trailing valve load some of the trailing valve loads picked up. And so this is this is actually fluid load on the downstroke on the rod stream because the trailing valve moved up and picked up some load and here it's leaking off. See it drops. If we'd waited, we'd seen it drop off just like this load drops off. So it's because I, I, I goofed up when I stopped. I didn't stop very well. Okay. Well just the recommendation is to stop the unit smoothly. Yes, that's that's right. That's good, good comment. You know, you 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 look at the at the at the at the weights and the crank and the horse's head, and you get an idea of where of where the crank is that you can see with respect to the rod string, and then you think, okay, when 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 it's about right there, I'm going to kill the motor, and then I'm going to gradually pull the brake, and that's how you do it on a a, a unit that has like a you know, a, a hundred hundred inch stroke. It's not going too fast. That's typically how I do it. I just I just watch it, and then I say, okay, I'm going to turn it off right here. I'm going to gradually pull the brake to come to a gradual stop, and not try to not try to pull it too hard. One more question is: uh, looking at the polish rod stroke length versus the plunger stroke length, what factors affect the difference in length? Well. Um, the pumping speed and the and and the fluid load and so and so um, when this is a surface surface stroke of 168 inches and this pump stroke is 156 inches so it's it's less and it's less due to the stretch of picking up the fluid load and so if we go back and look at that that uh, this display here I don't remember where it's at I think it's at the beginning here the fluid load's a maximum because there's no there's no intake pressure. The fluid is down at the pump. And so this means that there's a lot more load and this is more stretched. See here's the the peak load's higher because you had to stretch the rods more, which means you stretch the rods and you lose more inches. So um, the fluid load over so the fluid load divided by the the if you were to to stretch the rods the entire stroke length. 27% of the entire um, rod stretch to stretch the stroke length is lost to pick up the fluid load. If we go down to a high, to a, if we raise the fluid level to 200 pounds of pump intake pressure, now only 25% of the stretch required to stretch the, to the rod string 100 inches is lost because we have less load. We have comparably less 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 stretch and the peak load is going to be less and so as the fluid load increases or you know here as the fluid load increases you get less stroke okay now that's that's one part and so here we have the highest pump intake pressure and the lowest fluid load and we're only losing about 26 21 percent of the total rod st stroke to stretch due to the fluid load now well, we're pumping a certain speed right here, and it and it and it, it's probably around five strokes a minute. If we were to if we were to increase the pumping speed, then that's going to create more acceleration and tend to cause the pump stroke to get longer. So you have a thing called over travel and under travel. The faster you pump, the more over travel you get. The more the downhill stroke increases. The the more the load the more load you have, the shorter the stroke gets because of more stretch rod right stretch. And so that's that's how you that's the two that's the two things. More load okay. or more mechanical friction, less downhill stroke. Less friction, higher pump intake pressure, longer stroke, faster speed, longer stroke, more over travel. Right. We have a couple of more things to refresh, and uh, one of those starts asking if you can talk again about. Uh, the counterbalance effect and how to measure it. Um, I think next week we we'll probably have a, a, a little uh, workshop. Carrying it's called a workshop on, on basics, um, and we'll talk about acquisition of data and we'll talk about the counterbalance effect test. Um, and so, if we look at that that slide here, let me find that slide. We talk about that load. I'll, I'll pop it up here real quick. And this kind of talks about the procedure, but 
this this procedure here isn't shown isn't being shown inside of the the TAM software. It's just it's just a discussion. And so when you do the CBE test with a you're you're gonna you're gonna try to measure the effect of the weights and cranks with your load cell, not your PRT, with your load cell to polish rod. That means you're going to try to weigh the, the weights and the crank at the polish rod. Well, how in the heck can you weigh the crank and the, and the weights? You can't really do that. So the way you do that is you balance, the, you balance the weight of the crank and the weights with the weight of the rod string in fluid plus some of the fluid load. And when, that, when, the, when the weight of the fluid load on the rod string in fluid matches a counterbalance of flat effect weight if you were if you release the brake then the crank stays level so let's let's read this again you stop the pumping unit on the upstroke with the crank level now if, if you were to if you were to stop it and release the brake the the weights are going to go straight up because the fluid load is is if it's if it's properly balanced the fluid load is going to be a lot h higher than the effect of the counterbalance by by half the fluid load, this much, this much weight, and so in this in this well, the CBE loads around 45, 14,500 pounds. I think that's right. One, two, three, four, fourteen thousand pounds, fourteen thousand two hundred pounds or so. And so, if we were to stop, and the the way the rods is is seventeen thousand six hundred pounds, then the rod string is going to go down, and the crank's going to go right back up, and it wouldn't be in balance. So you have to wait. When you stop with the crank level, as the fluid slips between the plunger and the barrel, and the load, the, the fluid load is going to drop off. So, so my, so, so if I oh, were to sli slide twenty eight, they might, might, they might see that the loads drop in, and at some point they should release the brake. That's right. That's a good. That's a good comment, Gustavo. And so here, here is the fluid load lo dropping off. And so during this time, when the fluid load is dropping off from the trailing valve load to the standing valve load. Some point along this time, you will release the, the brake and the weights won't go up or down. And then you'll say, okay, aha, I know now what the, what the load cell is weighing. I know what the effect of the weights and the crank are at this point in time right here because it was in balance. The, the crank stayed level. It was, didn't go up or down. It exactly map balance the 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 standing valve load right here, weight rods in fluid, plus this much this much fluid load, and so that's that's the test we'll talk about next week. We'll discuss that next week during part of the presentation, and it'll be fairly fairly short. But it's a um, we have a how to on our webpage that talks about doing the CBE uh, test, and we also have a a, if you install TAM on your computer and you click on Help in TAM, then there's a very good discussion that Dr. Podio wrote in the Help part of the TAM software. And so, if you if you were to bring up TAM here, let me let me uh, escape out and just let's go on just a little bit here more. If you go into TAM and you click on Help, then there is a very detailed discussion of the CBE test right there. And discussion of it. It's a, it's an excellent re reference. So I would recommend you read this in TAM, and then you email one of us, you know, Ken or you, Gustavo or Carrie Ann or myself or Dr. Podio a question, and we'd be more than glad to further answer your question about the CBE test. But 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 you ought to read this first. Now, if this I, this well probably doesn't have a CBE test. I don't know if I have an example of the CBE test. Of these eight examples, but I, I may I'll, if I see it, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. What? I I actually put on the chat a link on the how to to the website where you can download the CVE instructions or, or instructions how to perform a counterbalance effect test. Yeah, and that's you, you can have that too if you go to that link and plus much other information. Yeah, we we have one for the TAM software and one for the TVM software both. So there's there's a how to for both the wired equipment and the TAM software. And that would clarify one of the questions from the private chat. No, you don't You don't put a chain on the unit. You don't chain it. Uh, just uh, break it. You just use a brake for yeah. the test. That's the easiest way to do it. A chain just uh, 
stores potential en energy and makes it a little bit more dangerous to do. You have to be careful if you use a chain. You always need to be careful, but if you use a chain, there could be a force on the chain. If the chain were to break or snap or something, then it can cause harm. So you should be careful, very careful using a chain on the pump unit to hold the load, the rod load. Are there any other questions, Gustavo? No, I think you can, if you have examples to cover, oh. All right. jump in there. All right, so I'm going to, let me set time. We got about we got about 30 more minutes. So if we go pick it pick an example here, and the, when you install the example file on your computer, it'll put in the echo meter online folder on your TAM your TAM folder TAM wells, and there's there's these are the examples that I that I picked. There's uh, anchored but not set the normal dynamometer card that we use to show the different re reference load lines, uh, the one that has the the rod part at 5,365 feet. This is a, the full the pump that's full liquid that has anchor tubing, um, and this is unanchored tubing here. And this is the Sandia data that was captured at the same time we measured the data down in the well. Um, this is the one where the trailing valve sticks, trash sticks to trailing stand valve open. This sticks to trailing valve open, and this is a V11 well that's measured the PRT data. So I'm going to start off the very first one at the very top. And we'll look at that one first, and we'll we'll draw a reference load line. Well, here's here's a CBE test, and so if you look at this in the software, there's a there's a CBE button, and I've got the experimental mode turned on on my computer. But we have a we have a CBE button right here that was the test was done, and this line right here is is the time, the time at 54 seconds where the crank stayed level. And didn't move when we released the brake, and so that became the load, the CB load that we measured, of fourteen thousand four hundred thirty pounds. And so, so if you you have an example here in this first well, and it shows the load dropping off due to slippage, leaky pump, and we stopped here and did a CB test with the horseshoe load cell and weighed weighed the effect of the weight and the weights in the crank at the poly trot. So this is an example of it, and you can, uh, again, read the help on the CBE. Now, if you look at the dynamometer data, this is the dynamometer data, and it was measured with the horseshoe load cell. And one of the things that you want to note here is this FO from the fluid level line doesn't match up. And so whenever I look at a pump card and a surface card, I always look at FO from the flu level, the shot at flu level, because I want this line and the red pump card line to match up. And so it, it doesn't match. So there's so I then start looking at plunger sizes and tubing fluid gradients and flu level shots. And I'm gonna go look at the flu level shot here and, and show you guys something that, that this this is this is old data that was and I probably need to get a better example of because see that it stopped right there. And the well is much deeper. The, see, the well is much deeper. And the tubing went down to this depth, and the software stopped at about 7.6 seconds. It's, it's fairly old. That was done with the, the, the uh, probably the DOS software. And we stopped the acoustic trace after a second after you picked the liquid level. And so probably down here somewhere is the actual liquid level down near the pump. And it was and it was not, liquid level probably wasn't selected right. Is what I would guess is wrong with this. With this data, so this is this is more likely probably the acoustic trace was stopped too quick, and the liquid level is probably down here, and that's probably why this line right here and that line don't match up. Now, if I bring up the annotations uh, dialog here, or this, this this screen, and I want to use the annotations to look at this pump card, then I'm going to put on the pump card the tubing stretch line which is the black line, and I'm going to put on the unanchored tubing line, which is this line right here. Now, this is saying that there is no tubing anchor because the red line and the black line match up. But if we go back and look in the edit mode and look at the, because the name of the file is anchored but not set, if we go back and look at the mechanical well bore, there's an anchor that someone, probably me, turned off, 
And now when we turn the anchor back on, the anchor is set at 67, 64. And then length of the tubing that's anchored is from the surface down to 67, 64. And we calculate that, that spring constant. So let's, let's save this and close it. And now notice that the, this is the unanchored KT, but the anchored KT means the pump card should actually go up and down like that, but it's not. It's, it's, the anchor is not set. So it should follow this line. Well, it's not following that line. It's even over more, and this additional distance is slippage. And so when we, when we look at the drawing here, and we look at the animation, the, the animation over here shows that the, the, the tubing is not moving because we told it was anchored. So to make the, it move, I went into the software, and instead of taking the anchor out, all I did was go to the mechanical board and uncheck this anchor checkbox and save it because I'm pretty sure it's not set because, and that shows the anchor moving, the, the end of the tubing moving when you expand the fluid inside the pump chamber. So, so that's why I unchecked it because I wanted to show this motion here. If I were to uh, capture this screen and make an animation, I want to show that the tubing is moving and it wouldn't move if it showed an anchor. That's how that, that's how the software is programmed. So um, let me say this one more time. If you, if your well has an anchor and an anchor is set and the line leans over more than the anchored line like it does here, then that distance, additional distance here is slippage. Now if we go into the Rotoflex well and pick that one, this one has a tight pump clearance. And this well, this well was, um, if you look at the unanchored line, this is where the, this is where the pump card would, would run on the red line if it were unanchored. And so it's not, it's not, it's to the left of the tubing movement line. And so it's this distance from that point right there to that actual measured point, that reason why it's leaned over is due to slippage. The tubing is anchored, but there's slippage. And why is there slippage? Because this is a big diameter plunger. So if we go and click on edit, and we go look at the um, edit tab on the pump information, we'll see on the lift system, we'll see that the plunger size is two inch. So it's a big pump, and the bigger the pump, the more the pump clearances are also is going to cause slippage. So this is this is a contributor of slippage, and it's only four foot long. You can increase the pump length and make it the plunger length and make it leak less. But they run a two inch pump, a four foot pump, with uh, typical clearances for prior to 2007 uh, to be typically uh, less than you know less than four thousandths of an inch, it's three or four thousandths of an inch pump clearance. So this is just slippage, and that's because it's a two inch pump. Um, and the pump card's up here at FO Max. Well, it's a little more than that. Is that is that mechanical friction? That maybe some, but but you know that's 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 what that. And and also notice that the tubing pressure is fifty. Uh, the default for the tubing pressure is fifty uh, in TWM in the past. So that just is probably not entered or not measured. If you see a fifty, that sometimes just means it wasn't measured. So that. That could have also affected that line a little bit. Um, there's a little bit of gas because see over here, this line leans over more than the red line on this side. And so so probably there's a little bit of gas compression. There's a little bit of gas in the pump. Uh, not a lot, but there, but th there is some incomplete pump flows due to gas. Uh, or it would have the same slope on both sides. Um, and you can see this little drop in load right here. That's that's probably the release of mechanical friction. That could be that's some kind of and see that vertical line. That vertical line is mechanical friction. So this is this this drop in load is that right there. That's the release of mechanical friction. Um, 
And so, so in this example here, we have the weighted rods in fluid. And this line goes, the measure data goes below the weighted rods in fluid. Because why? Well, because of that that the acceleration force of releasing the fluid load. And so this is this is the the uh, load is measured. See, we're only holding up from that point right there on. We're only we're only carrying uh, uh, the weight of rods and fluid. But it's it's not it. You don't ever see this red this this load on the downstroke match the dashed line unless you're going very 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 slow. Uh, a pumping speed and there's there's no acceleration force, and so when we when we um, release the fluid load, we create this acceleration force right here, and then that force echoes up and down the rod string, and that's the that's the echo over 8,000 foot of, of rods round trip, and there's probably another echo and probably there's another echo, and so those those echoes or repeats are the the acceleration force echoing up and down the rod string. Uh, due to uh, the, the acoustic velocity in the steel, uh, the, the force travels through the steel about 16,300 feet per second. And that's the uh, acoustic velocity in steel. All right. Um, if we were to show the um, trailing valve load with the f f fluid load measured, that would be that line right there. And that's pretty much the same line as the uh, FO max with zero pump intake pressure, they're just, they're just a little bit different because in this case, in this case, the fluid level is down, down, down to pump, down to the down, down under the pump intake. So there's not much liquid level in this in this way. Um, does everybody see this? See this? This black line is if it's anchored, no slippage. The red line is no slippage, unanchored. And so our our this line is to the left of the unanchored line. It is anchored, and the tubing is not moving. It's just slippage past slippage past the plunger causes the pump card to lean over a little bit. All right. One. You know, when I when I look at the surface card and the pump card, I I typically don't like to put them on separate plots. So I almost always I almost always uh, check that box at the beginning. But one of the one of the one of the disadvantages or advantages of making it on the same plot, if you make a separate plot for the pump card and the surface card, is that you fill up the whole screen with only the pump card at the bottom. You fill up the whole screen with the surface card at the top. Now. If you had a shallow well, then the surface loads would, would cross over the pump car loads, and it may make it less clear. And so one advantage to having this checkbox would be maybe use it for a shallow well where there's where the surface card and the pump card are load lines are crossing each other. Another thing that the reason why I particularly like showing them on one plot is I want to see the stretch, the effect of the I want to see the pump card shorter or longer by looking at the screen. And so by just looking at the screen, I can see that the surface stroke is being lost to stretch because the pump stroke is less than the surface stroke. That's why I usually that's why I usually have the surface card and pump card on one plot. Um, a few times it has made a problem. It has helped me identify a problem when the pump card didn't fill the whole screen because I realized with it on its own plot, it looked like it was a, a a big load, but it was a little tiny pump card, and so it's it's somewhat important to uh, to me anyway to put them on their all all on one plot. So usually I check that. Okay, the next one is uh, the rod part one. This is this is a well that that, that Ken Ken clicked this a long time in the past. This is a great example. And there's there's a if you look at that um, paper back in 1958, one of one of the diagnostic steps says if you stop anywhere during the stroke, and your rod weight is less than the weight of rods in fluid, 
if you stop every place and it's about the same load, then you're likely, your well likely has a rod part. And so you can use the valve test and stop any place during the stroke. And any place you stop, upstroke or downstroke, you see a lower load. Um, that would be a, a way to say, hey, this looks like I've got a uh, rod part just based on your on your surface load measurements. Because you, you can see, if you go to the annotations, uh, you can see what the weight of rods and fluid are. So right here, we, sh we show you what it should be. And if you are measuring less than that every point during the stroke, less than 14,565 pounds, which we, are, which we are, if you take your mouse and run it along everywhere throughout the stroke, the, the second number is the, is the load. The f first number, 50.67, is the inches of stroke. So inches of stroke versus load. And we can see that any place during this stroke, it's less than that line right there. Now, so, so if you look at the annotations, we also show you what the rod, the weight of rods in fluid should be in fluid. It's fourteen thousand five hundred and sixty-five. So let me write that down: fourteen thousand five hundred and sixty-five pounds. Now, if I go over to the the rod string, I can either click the rod string on the screen right here, and the rod string will pop open right there. And so there's my rod string by just clicking on it. Or if I don't want to do it that way, I could I could go into edit and the rod string will and I like to use the detailed method to show the data. And so I'm I have the detailed view opened. And if I go to list system and go to uh, rod string, then this is the same rod string I saw a minute ago. So now if I if I go into here and I remove the 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 one inch rod. So I'm going to change my rod string. So if I, I'm going to change the rod string, I don't want to forget it. I'm going to bring up my uh, snipper and I'm going to snip the taper so I don't forget it and save that. And so now I know what it I know what it what it what it is and I save that. And now I look right there. I say, oh the, the weight of rods in fluid in air of the of the um, weight bars is about 18,000 pounds. Well, I, I am missing 3,500 pounds. This, this distance from here, from the zero load line down to the pump card is about 3,500 pounds too low. And I need this pump card to come up, so I'm going to take away 3,500 3, pounds. But this is in air, and I want to take away 3,500 pounds in fluid. So I could bring up my calculator and say... Um, the rods and fluid, the, the, the buoyancy is, is uh, 0.128. So 0 .12, 0 0.128 is the buoyancy force. Or you can subtract 1 minus 0.128, and that equals the, the, the weight of rods and fluid multiplier. And so if I, so if I take... 17,000, 1,795 pounds, and multiply that by 0 0.82. 1,795. I'll put 0 0.7. Yes. 0.128. I made a mistake. You're right. 1,795. You have to put the 0.7, but I'm gonna put it there, and say equals. So now, if I take the weight, if I take the weight bar, the weight bars away, this this rod string weight in, in fluid is going to change about 14,000 pounds, 1,472 pounds. So um, you subtracted one minus 0.128, then you you miss it too. That's what I'll. That's how much weight I'll lose if I take the weight bars away. Instead of 18, 1,800 pounds, I'm not going to lose eighteen hundred pounds because I, it, it doesn't weigh that much in fluid. So if I, I'm going to use four fifteen hundred pounds. So so let's let's take it away. So we go take it away, and say none there, and save it. And then my well, it doesn't quite work right because uh, I need to change the tubing size to two and seven eighths, two and seven eighths inches. Two, two and seven eighths.
in the casing too. That seven inch casing. Seven inch. Yeah. And save that. All right. So now it moved it moved up about fifteen hundred pounds. Not eighteen hundred pounds because you have to adjust out the, the, the weight rising fluid. Another thing that you might notice here is notice that the horsepower is negative. That means that the load line on the down stroke is on the up and the, the so this is this is a negative horsepower. That means we're actually injecting fluid and in, no, I don't mean that. So if we were to if we this little triangle says that you click on the triangle, do you want the pump horsepower to be <coughs> Excuse me, uh, zero. You say yes. Now, this is the damping factor if the entire rod string is in the well, 0 0.097 and 0 0.145. If we uh, make the horse, and that's causing the too much damping to be removed and making the horsepower to be uh, negative. So if we were to say, okay, let's adjust the damping factor and say yes, then for that stroke right there, we made it a little bit. Uh, and now their pump card is flat, and the, the pump horsepower is zero with a slight adjustment and damping factors. So I'm going to go back into edit mode here, and I'm going to take off the, the rest of the rod string. And if I go back to lift system, and I go here, and I know the number there is 953. If I take off, let's say, uh, make it 1,500 foot of... Um, of three quarter inch rods and I tab out of that and I save it it's going to move closer to zero and if I take off and make this 953 then the midpoint of the rod string is going to be sitting right on zero it should be anyway and say save and that's going to be uh, maybe took a little bit too much out anyway but that's that's I would have I wouldn't have guessed 953 if I couldn't make my pump cards, but here sit on zero. So yeah, it's it's not perfect, but it's it, you can tell that there's the rod part is midway or close midway of the three quarter inch sucker rods. By adjusting the length, you can tell about where it's at. All right, so I think we're about finished. Let me just see if there's any other examples we should look at real quick, and then I'll, then I'll be quiet. Um. Five minutes from two hours. Yes. Plenty of time. So this the trash sticks the trailing valve open is a is a pretty interesting example data set because it was acquired with the PRT and now this is this is horseshoe load cell. This is this is you lose your fluid load. So if we go look at the the this is this is a valve test and we see here that all we're seeing is a weight of rods in fluid when we stop because the trash has stuck the trailing valve open and that's what this example is and if we go back and look at the the data and we look at this is where it occurred if we look at the, the raw data we see that stroke 10 is okay 11 is okay 12 is okay and then bam the rest of the strokes the trailing valve is stuck open it didn't if we'd seen it had a rod part you had seen huge acceleration forces that we didn't see, and then and the and the rod was would have parted right at the peak load. So we'd have seen the, the load fall off the peak load. So this is this is the view of the data versus time, and you can see that a lot of data was collected, and it it never really changed after this point right here when the trailing valve stuck open due to some kind of uh, solids. If we go and look at the the first 13 strokes. If I go look at the first 13 strokes and go into go into the the field view, and I want to overlay the strokes, and let me go to st stroke number stroke number one. So there's stroke number one, and I want to I want to add some additional strokes, and so here here is the strokes, and I want to I want to overlay these strokes on top of stroke number one. I'm going to hold down. The control key on my keyboard and go stroke number two, and there's and then stroke number three, and stroke number four, and five, and six, and see how well they're repeating seven, 
and eight. And now see nine, nine, there's a little bit of tracks right there in stroke number nine. We had a delayed closing the trailing valve and, and that was a shock load. You would have you would have felt this shock load at the surface and it's from four let's see there's five thousand to about five thousand six hundred pounds. It would have felt like suddenly fifteen hundred pounds of, of load dropped right there at your feet if you're collecting this data. Stroke ten, stroke eleven, and then if we go a little farther, stroke twelve, and then stroke thirteen is is the and look. Stroke 13 is a longer stroke than the stroke 1 through 12. Why is it? Why is stroke 12 shorter? Because the fluid load took up stretch, and so this is our this is our stroke we lost due to picking up the fluid load. And here is the over travel effect. And actually, the pump stroke is longer than the surface stroke uh, when there is no fluid load. Because why? Because we're pumping about six strokes a minute, and that creates an acceleration force in the rod string. All right. So, so if we take our mouse and run our mouse through these cards right here, the card that I'm on is highlighted in green, and I can tell which stroke I'm at. And so this is a this is an example of using the field view to overlay strokes, and it's and it's showing the average. See, it says average here, average, average, average. So all these values here are average based on the strokes you've picked. So when you use the field view, you can determine the average value of multiple strokes. Whereas on the details view, you see only one stroke. It's the, it's the stroke you select, whatever stroke you select. And this adjusted pump displacement is for stroke number 11. And you can see stroke number 11 by putting the event viewer up here. And clicking on stroke number 11, or clicking on, let's say, another stroke, stroke number 9. If you want to um, adjust it, see, this This is delayed closing traveling valve. You'd pull your traveling valve close to right about there. It's going to reduce your adjusted pump stroke due to delay of the closing traveling valve. So that's something we added uh, in the uh, uh, adjustment. The little eye, little eye spot there tells you how we're adjusting the pump stroke. All right. Well, Carrie Ann, I think I've run my time for two hours. Hope everybody's enjoyed the presentation. I kind of went uh, uh, in detail on one. I probably could have gone, covered more topics on other all the cards, but I didn't do that. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you, Gustavo, for your help with the Q&A. Um, we'd like to thank all of you guys for joining us today for the great questions and feedback. So, as Lynn mentioned, yet uh, next week we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to attempt to hold a dynamometer workshop. Um, so we're going to cover acquisition a little bit. If you're using the PRT in the load cell, just to make sure you know when you're getting some good quality data. And then we're just going to start putting up some scenarios and data and just talk through analyzing the data and what to look for. And you know, hopefully that's just going to kind of compile the things that we've been talking about for the last several sessions and just allowing you guys to see it applied in a practical manner. So I'll have some uh, links to the workbook and to the data so that you guys can download that for the session, hopefully kind of walk, talk through it with us. And we'll try to keep that interaction going as we have been, just to kind of keep questions coming along even during the session. So um, we appreciate your time. We're glad you joined us, and we look forward to seeing you all again next Wednesday. So have a great week. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.